Welcome to On the Issues. I'm Councilwoman Thelda Williams. On today's show, we'll have several guests joining us, including Phoenix Census Director, Albert Santana, the City Water Resource Management Advisor, Cynthia Campbell, and Brennan Nelson from the Arizona Humane Society. First up is Albert Santana. Albert, welcome to the show. Councilwoman, thank you for having me on your show. You have the biggest job in town right now, <laughs> counting everyone who lives here. Right. How are you doing it? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for helping to, to help lead the charge on our City of Phoenix Census Ad Hoc Committee. Your leadership and the committee's leadership has really helped guide us in putting some groundwork on helping to put our, our campaign together. Um, it's like you said, it's, it's a heavy lift and um, you know, we're the fifth largest city in the country and really the, the key for us has been counting on our partners, both the community-based organizations, um, all of the city departments and all the resources that they have our city's complete count committee, which has included some outstanding uh, leaders throughout various communities. So together we're all working um, under a goal of making sure that everyone living in our city is counted and, and really talking about the importance and the impacts that the census has on our community. Which is? So, so really what, what people have come to learn is that they understand that every 10 years that the federal government does have a responsibility to do an enumeration, a count of everyone living in our country, everyone living in our cities. But I think the biggest education piece and, and what we've helped work with our various community groups is that the census is truly a lifeline for us and for the city of Phoenix for all the programs that we have, all the community programs we have, whether it's our Head Start programs, our after school programs, transportation, public safety, uh, virtually every city department that we have. So making sure that we have an accurate count for everyone living here helps us to ensure that we then have the resources to provide those services that people depend on every day. Because we don't have the federal resources, it will have a huge impact for a name. Absolutely, absolutely. At, at the federal level, um, it's about $675 billion of resources that are distributed throughout the country. Uh, for us as a state, Arizona truly is, is a receiver when it comes to federal funding. At the state level, uh, and this number is on an annual basis, it's about $20 billion annually for 50, 55 programs that the state helps to oversee. And then as we started to drill down a little more with us here in the city of Phoenix, it's a really large number as well. It's about $866 million a year for services that we directly provide as a local municipality. So as you can see, uh, the impact to these resources and the ability for you to help us and work in partnership to do the job to provide the quality of life and keep us being the fastest growing city, uh, the census and having an accurate count is absolutely vital for us to continue to be sustainable and successful. So how are people going to enroll, be counted? So uh, really, we're only about 50 days away Ooh. for when people can actually start to, to, um, to respond. And a couple things that I would like the viewers to know is that there, there are several things that are new this time to the Census Bureau for the first time in history. So for the first time in the Census Bureau's history, people and households will be able to respond in a digital format, meaning that whether it be online, on a computer, on their cell phone, on a tablet, People will also have the option to respond via phone. And then if people do want to respond the traditional way with the paper questionnaire, that option is absolutely still available. So we want to make sure that people do know that while there has been marketing and, and conversations about the digital census and being able to respond on the phone, the traditional way of a paper census questionnaire is absolutely still an option and people have all three that they can select from. So uh, census day is April 1, so people will start to hear about a lot about April 1. And really what census day is about is where you are living in the country as of April 1, 2020. But the reality is, is that beginning as early as March 12th, the online versions and paper questionnaires will be available for households throughout the country so people can start to respond as early as March 12th. So we're excited. It's been a, a, a kind of quite the journey in working with all the groups to get ready for now. But, uh, but I think that together as a community and working with us as a city at the state level and with our federal partners, we're ready to go. We're, we're excited and we're really trying to create the awareness about how when you participate in the census, you count for education, you help to support your children, you help to support transportation, you help to support health services. So it's not just about actually filling out a form so you can be counted by the federal government. It's really more about 
doing our part so that way we can help to support those services that we all depend on. It makes a big difference for this community. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and the, really the, the things that we're starting to try to make awareness are, if I had to say, Councilwoman, there's really three parts that I, that I want the viewers to, to, to hear about today and as a part of this segment is that, first, the census is important. It's absolutely important because of the resources that the census does provide to all of us throughout all the different communities throughout our city. The second part is that it is safe. It is absolutely protected that the Census Bureau is not allowed to share any of the information with any other agencies. It's purely based for statistical data that we all need. That's the point absolutely. I keep hearing about. Absolutely. People are fearful. Absolutely. And, and we completely understand that. So we've been working really close with our partners at the Census Bureau to try to inform the public that it absolutely is safe. There are strong laws for Census Bureau staff that they must abide by to not share any of this information. Again, it's purely for statistical uh, reasons. And then the third part is that it's easy. It really takes about, it's eight questions. It only takes about 10 minutes for each household to fill it out. So truly you'll be able to fill it out with no problem. So again, the three R is that it's important, it's safe, and it's easy. So we wanna make sure people understand all three of those as we get ready for a time when people can start to respond. So if you live in a house that doesn't have uh, computers or tablets, mm -hmm. or you don't have a smartphone, how do you get to do it? So what's gonna happen is the week of March 12th, which again is about 50 days away, the notifications will be sent out from the Census Bureau to all the households, all the addresses throughout the entire country. They'll receive a letter. They're also gonna receive a postcard. Some of the households will also receive the questionnaire on the very first mailing, the actual paper questionnaire. So to answer your question, if you don't have uh, a computer at home or a smartphone or, or a telephone, or if you just don't feel comfortable responding in either one of those formats, the paper questionnaire will still be an option for you. So between March 12th and April 30th, the Census Bureau will be sending out five reminders about responding so that way you would be able to self-respond. One of those uh, mailings is going to include the questionnaire. So that way, if you still want to respond via paper, they are going to send virtually every household a paper form. So that way you will always have all three options. Again, the traditional paper format. If you do want to try for the first time doing it on phone or in a digital format, this is just simply giving people more options to be able to, to reply to the census via self-response. Um, now, after April 30th, if, if any of the households have not responded after the five notifications have gone out, what happens in May and June is called non-response follow-up. So that's when the enumerators, those are the individuals that walk throughout the neighborhood and they actually come in contact with the households and just remind people that, hey, you know, we haven't heard from you yet and we want to make sure that you are counted. And so that's when the actual enumerators will be out on the streets between May and June. But if you happen to have replied in March or April, you can avoid those knocks at your door by simply self-replying. <laughs> you know, I, I thank you for all that you're doing on this because it's a mighty challenge. It is, it's quite the challenge. Um, it's been an exciting project, uh, but, but it honestly has taken partnerships. Um, the city of Phoenix is great and we always step up to the plate to do our part, but I can't underscore the, the power in partnerships between at the regional level with all the other cities throughout Maricopa County, with all of the great community-based organizations, our uh, partnership with the governor's office and uh, other places throughout the state, and then of course at the federal level. And then last but definitely not least, the, the leadership that we have at the mayor and city council, you all have given us some resources to be able to help work with, within our community. And so with that, I'd also like to make sure people um, are aware of our website. We, do, we did create a, a regional website, and that website is icount2020.info. So if people can go to icount2020.info, we have all of this information. And then beginning March 12th, we will actually have a link where people can be able to fill out their uh, census and, and return it. Well, I want to thank you for coming today and talking about this and for all the hard work you're doing. We thank really so appreciate much. it. We know you have a great team. You have a great committee that volunteered to work on it. And I'm so delighted to hear that the response from the community is so positive. So. Congratulations. Thank you. Next, in the previously recorded segment, I catch up with Cynthia Campbell, Phoenix Water Resources Management Advisor. Well, 
Welcome to On the Issues. I'm Councilwoman Thelda Williams. Joining us today is Phoenix Water Resources Management Advisor, Cynthia Campbell. Welcome to the show, Cynthia. Thank you very much for having me today. Well, you have been experiencing the year of water, yes, or lack of water, I'm not sure <laughs> which way. And you have been our chief negotiator attending probably a couple hundred meetings. Quite a few. Tell us what's been going on this year and where we are today. Sure. Um, well, my role uh, for the city of Phoenix is to kind of manage the city's water portfolio. So I keep an eye on all of the city's water resources um, and where we are and long-term policy planning for the future. So what's been going on this year is the Drought Contingency Plan, or DCP, um, for all those people who've heard that acronym and don't know what it means. Uh, what it is, it's been an effort for the state of Arizona to sign on to a seven state deal that will try to address the issues on the Colorado River in the short term, meaning between now and 2026. So what we're trying to do is find ways to make sure that Lake Mead doesn't drop to very dangerous levels that could threaten our water supplies, um, or at least that part of our water supply. So I've attended a lot of meetings, a lot of <laughs> negotiations. Um, as some of them have been more pleasant than others, but I'm happy to report that Arizona finally agreed to sign on to the DCP, and we came up with uh, an implementation agreement in Arizona that makes sure that all parties are taken care of, uh, municipal water, industrial, agricultural as well, um, and most importantly, in some ways, the, the party that played the biggest role, the tribal interests. It's been an interesting adventure for you. Uh, it definitely uh, has, it definitely has. Uh, you know, the question, are we gonna run out of water? No, no, Phoenix is not gonna run out of water uh, for many, many, many years. We have an assured 100 year water supply and our water supply is backed up by a diverse set of resources, which is one of the things that makes Phoenix uh, unique is, is that we have a very robust portfolio. So what that means is, is our water comes from different sources. We get water from the Salt and Verde Rivers through SRP. We get water from the Colorado River through the Central Arizona Project. We also have a vast amount of groundwater underneath our feet, which right now we don't touch effectively. It just stays there for the future in the event that we need it when, if our surface water supplies are shorted in any way. So we're in good shape. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, you know, one of the things we continue to talk about and we'll talk about in another segment too, is conserving water. Yes. How do we do that? That conserving water is a very important function and we're very proud to say that Phoenix water customers share our desire to have a culture of conservation. And so what that means is, is we think that people who live in the desert cannot ignore the fact that water is a precious and very much a finite resource. And so people tend to think a little bit differently when they live in the desert. Um, but there's always room for improvement. And what we've been doing, uh, we've been working with a, a group of citizens to try to address what are our next steps in water conservation, because conservation plays an important role in how we use our water, how we manage our resources. I think I read somewhere, or you might have even told me, that the state is going to convene another group to talk about beyond the DCP. Yes. And part of the governor's uh, task is a conservation program. Yes. So Phoenix, once again, is going to be out ahead of the rest? We absolutely will be out ahead of the rest. Um, what, there are a number of important water issues that are going on right now and will be continuing um, probably for the near foreseeable future, but some of them that are coming up on the horizon is, is that after the drought contingency plan that we just put into place is finished, which is the end of 2026, there will have to be another plan among the seven basin states for how to manage the Colorado River in the face of what we call a structural deficit. We use a little too much of it in the lower basin states, as well as climate change that's affecting all of us. So those that will be coming. 
The other issue that will be a very hot topic coming up in Arizona is groundwater and how we deal with our groundwater both within the uh, urban areas that are more heavily regulated, but also within the rural areas that are not as heavily regulated on groundwater and are now having problems with groundwater overdraft, too much coming out. Is that due to the agriculture or to the fact that a lot of them are being developed into residential and more business community? Sure, agriculture actually uses vastly more water than uh, municipal or residential uses do, and that's just the nature of the, of the activity. Um, so in the rural areas, a lot of it is due to agriculture, that is a big part of it, but as some of those areas are starting to develop, those also, those have impacts as well. So there needs to be some way to, to make sure that the urban areas, we feel comfortable that our Groundwater Management Act the state enacted in 1980 helps protect our urban areas, but we need to make sure that our rural areas are also protected so people who live in those areas don't lose access to groundwater because it's the groundwater tables drop so much. Now this used to be a large agricultural state. Uh, it still is. People don't think about Arizona having all these different types of crops, whether it's vegetables or wheat or Hemp, I believe, is the newest. Hemp is also out there, alfalfa. Um, if you look in the areas of the state in Yuma, that you know, we are the world-class leaders in winter vegetables uh, as a state because of our, our friends in the Yuma area, and they are very efficient in how they manage the water that's available to them. I, that's one of the questions I was gonna ask. Have they modernized their systems, or they still use old-fashioned irrigation, or? What do they do? Most of the agricultural interests in Arizona at this point have to be much more sophisticated than maybe what you would have seen years ago. So in, in large part they have. They've lined canals, of they, they put into place irrigation practices which are much more precise uh, than maybe they used to be. They've laser leveled some of the fields and it, it makes a big difference in how much water they use. And most of that has been done as a result of the fact that they just don't have as much ready access to water as might have been available in the past. And the future looks difficult for them in terms of more access to water. So they've, they've really had to do these things out of necessity, but they are very good at it. Good. Talk a little bit about how we work with our cities that surround us. Sure. Um, Phoenix is a founding member of the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association, or AMWA. AMWA is uh, a 10 cities in the valley, in the Valley of the Sun, that work together on water policy issues. We collaborate a lot. And I think that that's a really important issue that going forward as we get to a place where we might experience some shortages, I think it's gonna be very important for cities to work together to make sure that the water that is available to us is being used very efficiently. And so I think that means that we have to be able to work on scale and collaborate more and move water around more effectively in a way so no city in the valley is suffering from any impacts of shortage. It's interesting, I'm very fortunate I get to serve on that committee and uh, to hear each city is different on how they operate, um, how they distribute, where they even get their water. And it's always intriguing to me how creative they can be, be so different, but still be a collaboration that works as a body to mm -hmm. make sure our, our city's protected. We have um, questions about, I think it's, is it Goodyear that's gonna have the new manufacturing a million gallons a day. Goodyear has made some uh, big moves in terms of the kinds of businesses that it's bringing in and its water policy advisors are very busy right now trying to be very agile so they can get that water that they need. Well I understand that um, it doesn't impact us. The water is there. It will be reused and so um, we are happy they are getting the jobs and not impacting our water. Absolutely, absolutely. 
And, and that's one of the things that we all work together as cities to make sure that we're not, that we're not having disproportionate impacts on each other. Um, we work together, even cities as far away as Tucson. We've done a lot of work, Phoenix has done a lot of work directly with Tucson and formed some new, uh, very vibrant partnerships with Tucson to move water and in ways that helps them. So we move water that we have available today to Tucson and store it in the ground there in Tucson. And later on, when we need more water because our supplies are a little bit shorted, then we'll be able to ask Tucson to pull that water out of the ground on our behalf, use it there in Tucson, and in return, send us the same amount of water down the Central Arizona project so we can take it at our treatment plants. Very smart. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Th thank you. Um, it's one of our most precious resources. It takes a lot of skill to uh, keep everything going in the same direction, and I congratulate you for doing that. Now it's time for our newest segment, Williams and Wags, where we welcome the Arizona Humane Society to highlight adoptable pets and share with us important safety tips. Joining us from Humane Society is Brenda Nelson and a very special <laughs> guest. Can you tell us about this gentleman? Yes, yeah, so this is Maverick. Uh, he's two years old and as you can see, has just made himself at home here. <laughs> so thank you guys for letting him take over. Uh, but he is such a sweet boy, has a little bit of shepherd in him, as you can see, um, but really quite well behaved. Uh, he was actually, um, his owner was being questioned by police when uh, he took off and left Maverick behind. Aww. So he ended ended up at the Arizona Humane Society where he is now up for adoption. He gets a lot of staff love. Hey, where are you going, bud? Um, and is just such a good boy. He's going to make somebody a very good pet. Come here, Math. He says, come on, come I'm on, a star Mav. now. Come on, over here. <laughs> you can tell he's still in the puppy stage. Yeah, so. yeah, two years old, but still lots of puppy. Come here, Math. He's after the pillow come on. we took away from him. <laughs> I did remove a pillow. Okay. Yeah, he likes can we sit in my pillow. lap? Can we sit in my lap? So, and he's had all of his shots, right? Yeah, so the great thing when you adopt, they are either spayed or neutered, microchipped. They have their first round of vaccines. Uh, you get a free follow-up vet exam with BCA Animal Hospitals. So shelter pets are really just the complete package. They come totally ready to go and with, as you can see, a lot of personality. They do, they are spatial. <laughs> I, I love it when people rescue animals. Uh, yes, absolutely. And every family should have one of these. Absolutely. It's so rewarding. I know. It's special. So if I wanted to adopt him, how do I find him? Yeah, so he's available at our uh, Nina Mason Pulliam Campus for Compassion. You can visit the website azhumane.org. It does update every hour. So if you don't see his beautiful face on there, that means he's already been adopted. Um, but you just bring the family down to meet him. He probably would do better with some older kids just because he's got a lot of energy but seems to do well with other dogs and is a delight to riding in the car and um, is just a good good boy and it's maverick maverick yeah and somehow i think it fits you <laughs> yes i do yeah he's a great boy he's being so good yes he is so and i imagine you have lots more Yes, well, we always have so many pets up for adoption, and uh, we actually have some fun new programs coming. I know when people think of the Arizona Humane Society, they think just of pets and maybe not people and what we are able to do for people. Um, so through our Pet Resource Center this year, we're actually bringing on a resource navigator position. Oh, really? And what that will be is a social worker that actually, when people call in to our resource center needing things for their pets, if they need resources, Resources as well, um, then that social worker can connect them to the appropriate resources. So I love it. I love that too. Yeah, it's a, a position that we're trying um, out, uh, courtesy of the uh, Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust, helped with funding for that position. Um, and we just want to make sure that not only are the pets in our community getting what they need, but their owners are as well, because we're really committed to keeping pets and owners together, so people don't have to make that difficult decision to surrender them. I, you know, I love dogs and I'm always been one of those adopting mothers. <laughs> yeah. And, but I, I am a firm believer that they provide a lot of service. 
just the companionship, the, sometimes even the responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, you teach families, you teach kids, Absolutely. Uh, and they are so nurturing. Yeah, they really bring just a level of emotional support. You know, they get people out and about uh, walking and meeting new people. So if you ever do kind of feel, have feelings of <laughs> isolation or loneliness, they make you laugh, as we can see. I don't know what he's doing, but... You can tell them anything and they won't tattle on you. Exactly. Yeah, I have some pretty in-depth conversations with my dogs. So. I have had that too. And, it's, yeah, uh, and, and no matter what, they love you. They absolutely do. Unconditional love, huh, mister? <laughs> yes. So. Come here. Come on, go say hi. Can I give him so one more treat? She's been feeding him treats. Uh, if anyone's wondering what's been going on behind the scenes here. Yes. Yes. You're just a good baby. Yeah, good boy, Such Maverick. A... So he knows sit. He's potty trained. Um, he likes treats. Yeah. So yes, you, you do. When you adopt from a shelter, we know even if they're, you know, coming as a stray, we spend so much time with them that yes. we tend to know a lot about them and their quirks and one what more. they're, Just they're good more. at. And you stop that, mister. <laughs> yeah. He's very good about taking treats. Yeah, so I, I, I can re highly recommend him on yeah, that all right. count. Take no, nice that's all. Come on, she mister. says no more. Come on. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Oh, I know. I know you're a good baby. So, well, I highly recommend Maverick. Yes. I think it's, uh, Come here, he's smart, he's pretty. Yeah. He's very Come friendly. On. Come on, man. Yeah, he's he just gone like up to, to everybody. He does like to sleep on a here. sofa. Yeah, but if you have a sofa. Other than that. Yep, if you have a sofa, he's the guy for you. And for any pet owners out there, we have a lot of different um, services coming up uh, for you uh, for the month of February. Um, we're offering $20 spay neuter services. Oh, wow, good. Yes, and that's at both of our clinics. We have one in the South Phoenix area, also up at our Sunny Slope location. Um, you can start calling in February um, and just mention the $20 special, and we can get your pet in. Um, it's a fraction of the cost of what you might do uh, see in private Absolutely. practice um, and then it's also um, dental pet dental awareness month uh, so we are offering 10 percent off dental yes. services for your pet as well oh, wow. so that's good if you've been thinking about getting your pet in to get their teeth cleaned if they need any extractions you can do that through our full service clinic um, which is also in the South Mountain area and if you can believe it Last year, our team performed more than 17,000 spay neuter surgeries. So really focusing on cutting down on pet overpopulation in our community. Um, and even if you don't need spay neuter, we have our vaccine right. clinics every Friday. Um, it's just $21 a vaccine. There's no office charge and it's first come first serve. So I you can thank come you. down. And, and I'm a big believer in your organization. Yes, you've always been so, so supportive, so thank but you I for that. I highly want to recommend Maverick to one of our people who are watching out there. You're going to get a wonderful dog. <laughs> That's all the time we have for this month's On the Issues. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please call my office at 602-262-7444 or visit my website at phoenix.gov slash district1. We'll see you next time on the Issues. Thank you.